The next kind of thing is I am a card-carrying neuroscientist, or um, uh, at least pretend to be for these purposes. Um, and so um, I want to kind of talk about um, the brain and how the brain is developing and, and the role of experience. Um, and so this is where uh, this will probably be the only talk here that probably talks about non-human animals and preclinical models. So um, I read a lot of work and, and digest a lot of literature um, about um, mice and rats and how um, we can kind of alter or change or experimentally manipulate the conditions that rodents actually live in and look at accompanying brain changes. And so there's a couple kind of bits of, of important terminology that I'll just kind of have to kind of, again, keep everybody on board on this journey. So the first um, are kind of uh, portions of neurons. So neurons are the kind of ba basic and primary cell in the, in the, in the brain. Um, but we can think about um, on, the, on the one end is the synapse, which are these small gaps that kind of help kind of pass signal information, electrical or chemical signal, um, from one neuron to the other. And then uh, dendrites on the other side, um, which I always kind of use this kind of tree analogy. There's these branchy kind of extensions of neurons that receive um, input. And so um, we'll kind of hold that information in mind. And this is kind of molecular neuro, that's the kind of molecular neuroscience 101 that we'll need to kind of hold. And then the other thing we'll talk about um, and we'll kind of um, come back to a couple times in this talk are kind of two key brain regions. The first, um, being what's called the prefrontal cortex, or sometimes I'll use um, the, the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is the more expansive and larger term. The prefrontal cortex is the smaller portion of the frontal lobe, but for our purposes, we can just use the frontal lobe and prefrontal cortex interchangeably. Um, we can think about um, the prefrontal cortex, the frontal lobe is really at the, the front of our, our, our skull, is right kind of above our eyes, um, and is really involved with kind of these complex cognitive processes. Sometimes people say the things that make us truly human, um, the things that kind of um, allow us to kind of um, modulate our emotions, plan for the future, think about thinking, um, these very kind of complex people might say or use the term uh, executive functions. So these are, the prefrontal cortex is kind of critical and crucial to thinking about um, future consequences and kind of complex series of actions. So the other, oh, sorry, there, there's actually the prefrontal cortex, and it's kind of where it's shown in the brain. Um, the other uh, kind of big brain region that we'll focus on is a region called the hippocampus, which is shown here in red. And so the hippocampus is what's in the, what's called the medial temporal lobe. It's basically um, uh, behind your ears, but it, more in the middle of your brain, in the subcortex below the kind of cortical surface, the surface of the brain. Um, and the the hippocampus is really kind of critical for the formation of memory. Um, you can think about kind of episodes of TV or kind of this idea of episodic memory. There's a kind of snapshot, a small kind of moment, a series of events that the hippocampus is kind of critical for us to remember and to recall. Um, but the hippocampus, we kind of also know, is kind of central to kind of encoding and understanding perceptual elements and, and retrieving perceptual elements of kind of new events and stimuli. And when you kind of put all those pieces together, it's kind of a critical station, or we're kind of thinking of it of a, as a critical hub for learning. You can think about you have to kind of experience new situations in the world, and then you may have to draw upon experiences and memories you have to understand if the rules that you're kind of using in this new situation might be appropriate, or there's things that you could draw upon from your past experiences to kind of make more adaptive decisions. So the hippocampus is really kind of critical to kind of understanding and generalizing across context because of this kind of critical role in memory. So related to the hippocampus, um, there's some kind of really beautiful work um, focused on what's called environmental enrichment. So in brief, um, we often keep animals um, in preclinical models, preclinical trial work, um, uh, in kind of pretty fairly sparse cages. There's bedding, there's kind of uh, running wheels, there's kind of some things that they can kind of look around and kind of sniff and smell and do these things. Um, but some old work in the, in the 1960s and 70s um, by a guy named Bill Greeno and a guy named Mark Rosenvig um, really did this kind of cool experiments where they just gave, they gave rats kind of these way more complex cages. There were tubes, there were balls, there were things to jump around on and kind of run around and explore. Um, and this, some of this work has continued to today and people have kind of started to kind of look at kind of how the brain is changing molecularly when you look at these kind of standard housing, just you have a, you know, a water bottle and a running wheel and some bedding and you have these kind of more complex tricked out kind of cool cages that are very more enriched. Um, so what I'm going to show you is, is um, two kinds of data. One is um, uh, what's called confocal microscopy data, which is basically looking really specifically at cells and staining cells. And then another one is kind of cell drawings that kind of illustrate um, how cells may be branching and changing and maybe just bigger in size in these different conditions. And I'm going to show you kind of standard housing data 
um, as well as kind of these enriched housing data. So you can think about enriched housing and making our link to SES might be this kind of more affluent kind of um, section of the populace who have kind of more uh, resources and kind of more ability to kind of have more kind of exciting, stimulating things in their environment. So if you look at kind of standard housing, it's a little hard to see, um, but you want to kind of uh, focus your eyes or think about uh, primarily those little black dots. Um, I'll kind of step away from the mic for a second. Um, and you want to basically kind of look and note, it's a little hard to see. Other slides, I um, have it kind of uh, more attenuated or, or shown, um, but we're really kind of focusing on those black dots. Those are, those are new cells kind of growing in the brain. Um, and what you can see is in the enriched housing condition, um, hopefully folks can see it, I realize it's still small, is there's just kind of more of a kind of blotting of dots. It looks more like kind of chocolate chip cookie, um, kind of a lot more kind of um, smattering of dots. And these are basically new cells. More new cells are forming in the brain because of these enriched experiences, this enriched housing conditions that these animals are in. I should also note, these are adult animals. So the plasticity in their brain is a little bit lessened. We'll talk a little bit about plasticity as we go on. Um, but these animals, we're still seeing these differences and changes in adult animals exposed to kind of more er enriched and kind of uh, cooler environments. And so this is um, kind of cell staining molecular data, um, but then we can also kind of look <clears throat> at um, these cellular drawings. And so people basically look on a microscope and they kind of trace how the actual kind of cells are branching and how many kind of pieces they have. And you see kind of the same set of patterns where in the kind of enriched housing conditions, you see this kind of expansion of the cell. So there's more cells, the cells are more expansive, they're larger in nature. Um, and we think that this is kind of a positive thing. There's some data also to suggest that, that with more cells and kind of more bushier cells, these are the dendrites I was talking about, um, with greater kind of dendritic branching, that's a kind of more positive and um, powerful thing. You can kind of process and receive information in a faster way. Um, so that kind of really starts, I think, to speak to these little bits of experience that might matter in terms of enrichment. The other kind of piece that I'll talk about um, is work on stress exposure. So I talked a little bit about stress exposure at the beginning of the talk. Um, but uh, again, beautiful work in rodents allows us to manipulate um, genetically identi identi uh, identical rats um, and see what happens to their brain. So again, kind of rules out other third variables. The only thing that's changing is the specific exposure to stress that we are subjecting these animals to. I do not do this work, but I consume a lot of it. In brief, the way that we stress out these adult animals is put them in what basically is um, a glass plastic toilet paper tube. Um, it's called restraint stress. Um, and so you cause these animals to be restricted um, for a small amount of time, an hour, 35 minutes, something like that. Um, and then after this exposure to stress, um, you sacrifice the animals, and then um, you look at kind of what's, what, what's happening in their brain. And so again, related to these um, kind of uh, uh, cellular as well as these kind of cell-based drawings, we can start to see some kind of um, differences in these kind of con control versus stressed animals. Here's where I actually kind of um, have the cells uh, noted here. So um, basically, in the control animals, there's greater levels of cells. Um, the cells are branch here. Um, versus the stressed animals, there's lower levels of cells, there's less of what's called neurogenesis, and the cells are a little bit more restricted. Um, the dendritic branching, um, or sometimes people say dendritic arbors, is basically restricted. Um, the branches of the tree have basically been trimmed or cut, um, and that's because of the stress. There's, a, there's probably three decades of work that have done iterations of, the, of different iterations of this, kind of manipulating the animals' uh, experiences, uh, injecting them with, uh, with the stress hormone cortisol or the animal analog, um, and this has kind of beautifully been shown in every kind of which way that basically exposure to stress causes changes in neurogenesis as this new cell growth, as well as the expansion of um, cells and cell growth, which is called, uh, in this case, is dendritic arborization. Yes? So good, good question, was, is it, is it short-term or long-term? So this is pretty short-term. So you can think about, they're putting these rats in a toilet paper tube, a plastic toilet paper tube for about an hour, and then they're kind of letting them out, and then they, within the next day, they sacrifice them. So the thing that gets complicated, and you can think, these effects are even more pronounced if you are able to chronically stress out animals. So basically, um, 
you start to see what's called apoptosis, which is when cells actually start to die, um, uh, more commonly with chronic levels of stress. There's a lot of kind of methodological nuance to actually like kind of having a chronic stress response because the animals adapt, but you basically see this pattern where as you stress them out more chronically, you have more doses of this, um, you see kind of amplification of these same effects. Does that answer things? Um, so you can think about, um, if we're trying to make the link and analog to, to poverty, kids are getting hit with multiple stressors and they're getting hit repeatedly and often chronically. So you can think about many of the effects of poverty are chronic uh, cumulative levels of stress. Um, but this kind of early rodent work can kind of, I think, give us a roadmap and a guideline for thinking about the potential impacts. So um, we got experience, and like I said, these are all adult animals. Now, we really want to kind of turn to, and I'll just kind of put, submate, submate it probably about 20 years of, of human work um, about uh, brain development. So um, you can think about, you don't care about rats. I'm the weird scientist who really likes rats. But um, you know, uh, there's been a kind of a growth of work uh, looking at kind of basic uh, brain development um, in humans. And so especially kind of human children and adolescents have been kind of repeatedly scanned using non-invasive techniques like MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. Um, there's a lot of kind of beautiful work and beautiful summation of this work on the BrainFacts website. Um, there's been other kind of series at this um, uh, uh, convention, at this meeting, that kind of go through the basics of brain development um, and what we're learning. Um, so I'll kind of, uh, you know, just give you the like three slide version of it. Um, but if you want to learn more, um, especially for folks working with teenagers and kind of working with uh, different uh, young groups, this is kind of, I think, helps you, could help your pedagogy and to think about how the brain is changing. So, um, in brief, the basic idea, and I'll show this from a couple of perspectives, is the brain initially kind of grows in size and then actually kind of shrinks um, or kind of loses some um, aspects of connection. Um, and so I'll show that in a, in a video and then a, a different graph. Um, and so it'll be a really quick video. I'll try and play it a couple times. But the rough idea that you want to pay attention to are the colors of the brain. Um, and so basically warmer colors, yellows and reds, refer to kind of larger amounts of volume versus the bluer, greener, kind of cooler color, colors refer to less volume. And basically this is tracking the longitudinal development of the brain from about six years to about 16 years. And what you can see, or what I hope you will see, is the brain kind of starts out in a kind of very red, there's high levels of volume, and over time, um, the, the brain kind of starts to actually kind of lose volume. And this is only kind of into the kind of early teen years. I'll play that once more if it'll let me. Um, so you start out with kind of higher levels of volume indicated by the kind of red and yellows. Um, and then kind of as you get into the kind of teen years, you have a, a loss of volume. Um, showing that from a different perspective, using a kind of different graph. <clears throat> this work is, has all been done by a guy named Jay Geed. Um, who's at the National, was at the National Institute of Health and now is at the University of California at San Diego um, in the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, but what I'll show you um, in this graph, um, the horizontal axis is age, the vertical axis is the volume, and this is just of the frontal lobe. Um, what you see is early in development, there's a kind of increase um, from four to kind of six, eight years of age. You see kind of an increase in volume. Um, and boys and girls are shown on different um, lines. Um, but you get to... <clears throat> near puberty and basically the brain hits a peak. Um, and then the brain kind of starts to actually kind of plateau and then go down in volume. Uh, and so you can kind of see, it, it, we would say curvilinear and nonlinear kind of process happening where the, the brain initially grows and then kind of actually kind of um, loses volumes or shrinks a little bit. Um, and to make that even more cartoonish, um, the easier way that I often think about it and I talk about it um, when I kind of give field trips to the lab um, is often thinking about Early in development, you want kind of uh, your brain to be growing and to kind of a greater sense of flexibility. You want to be able to do a lot as a kid. You're gaining a ton of skills. And so your brain is actually kind of commensurate with that. You have behavioral flexibility. Your brain is larger in volume, and you have kind of these greater levels of connections. But then um, <clears throat> as you go into adolescence um, and then uh, early adulthood, there's this kind of push for behavioral specialization. You're kind of moving towards something, getting really good at a skill. Um, and so you're kind of able to kind of maybe prune away, we talk about it, this kind of tree metaphor, you prune away the unused or unneeded connections. And so the idea is that you have this early flexibility, your brain is growing, but then there's a point where um, your brain wants to specialize and kind of get really good and hone in some skills. Um, 
Interestingly, um, I showed you kind of structural MRI data from GEED, um, but you can also think about, and we can delve down into kind of different levels of neurobiology. This is where it kind of, we get back to the synapses. Um, we actually see that the number of synapses kind of starts to grow and increase early in development, um, a couple months postnatally, a couple years postnatally, um, but then um, as you get into kind of different, uh, you know, parts of, of kind of uh, uh, early childhood and early adolescence, um, the kind of number of synapses goes down. And so basically you want to track that um, at two years is kind of this like, you know, densely kind of connected forest, but then it kind of is slowly kind of thinning out um, at about six years of age. Um, there's debate and there's lots of different um, regional specificity. This is from a, a part of the brain that's more involved with kind of basic sensory processing. Um, so the times are a little bit different, but basically we see the same kind of pattern at different levels of neurobiology, because sometimes our MRI might be capturing something different than you can see in the actual synapses. This is human tissue, I should also say, I'm pretty sure. Um, so to go back, we have this kind of, and just to kind of recap all this kind of piece, you have behavioral flexibility and behavioral specialization at different points in development. And then you kind of have experience kind of coming in. And I think about experience kind of moving and changing these trajectories, um, just kind of bouncing and changing and altering things. And so that's kind of, I think, a starting place for then us to actually get into the, the work on poverty and what we're starting to learn there. Okay, everyone's still with me? Great. 